Okay, well, let's talk about transmission lines. Where were we and where are we going? Well, where we last left the class lecture last time, I had drawn this on the board. It was a brand new circuit element that you had never used before. You're used to capacitors and inductors and sources and resistors. And here I am giving you this brand new circuit device. Oh, he said this circuit has a, a lot of usage, a really old use that we talked about last time where uh, you can model the this long distance propagation of a telegraph signal. And we said because everything scales in electromagnetics with uh, wavelength, it turns out that's still a useful problem today when you're trying to send digital signals uh, uh, down an electrical trace on a motherboard, for example. In fact, you even use transmission line nowadays uh, when you're sending things down a trace inside an IC from one core to the next. The signals are so fast that you actually have to model transmission line effects. Um, so it's a very old problem and a very new problem. And this device, we said, has an intrinsic impedance a distance and it's also good to know the velocity of propagation. This of course has units of meters per second, this would have units of meters and this should have units of ohms. And we derived a system of equations that described how voltages and signals on here are on here. This is a slightly more complicated device than you're used to dealing with. You don't have a simple constitutive relationship like Ohm's law, this is V equals IR, or some first order differential relationship like uh, I equals C dV dt. But there is a basic relationship, and it turns out this is a, we're going to need a partial differential equation. And that's where we left the, the lecture off uh, last time. We said that the partial differential Direct, uh, differential equation that describes waveforms on this is second partial derivative of voltage with respect to space minus LC times the second partial derivative of voltage with respect to time is equal to zero. And it turns out you can write the exact same relationship with respect to the current waveform on there. Make sure we go to current. So this is the constitutive relationship. Um, for describing voltages and currents on the transmission line. Uh, a multivariable partial differential equation. Uh, oh, it's so beautiful, isn't it? And we said, why, did this, why do we need something this complicated? Because the transmission line is really an infinite number of intertwined infinitesimal uh, inductors and capacitors uh, that basically are discharged when nothing is connected to it and when you excite it on one end will start to charge up. And it turns out that we're, we're going to uh, explore the, the mathematical solution and what it physically means of this thing. This looks really complicated but don't be too scared because it, the physical uh, waveform that it describes, the generic solution that we talk about, really very simple to understand. I can explain it without any math. This, the solution to these equations represent a voltage and a current that propagate in tandem with a constant velocity of propagation in both the forward and the backwards direction. That's really all the solution to this means. These are called the telegrapher's equations because that's where they were first used. It describes the telegraph signal in voltage and waveform that propagate down the transmission line. Now, 
we're going to learn uh, some nuances and how to, to uh, analyze this. And as is often the case in, in electromagnetism, the laws governing the devices are extraordinarily simple. Simple mathematical equations. It's the boundary conditions that cause all the problems. Uh, yeah? Is the velocity constant or does it change? The velocity of propagation is a constant uh, as long as the transmission line is Z invariant with respect to its geometry. So the material and the, um, uh, the geometry of the two pieces of metal that are serving as your top and bottom bar and are abstract representation on the circuit diagram have the same geometry here and here and here. In fact, that's how we'll end this lecture. We're going to pass around and explore different uh, topologies for transmission lines. When I draw stuff on the board, it's always going to look like a top bar and a bottom bar. But the, the implementation of a transmission line is radically different. It could be just a twisted pair of wires. It could be a giant power line above a ground uh, the, the physical earth with, which acts as a ground path and a bottom bar return path. Um, it can be a, something etched, a structure etched on a printed circuit board, which I've brought several examples of uh, to show you. And I'll, I'll take pictures of those examples for the video students and put them online as well so that you can, even though you can't physically touch it, you can see what we're handing around in class. Uh, so yeah, this is it. it. This is it in all its gory details. You know, I, I should just, as an aside, this isn't like the most essential knowledge. I'm not going to test you on this, but if you are a super cool seventh level wave master, like you would collapse this to an operator, a differential, partial differential operator, and you could compactly describe this system of equations. operating on voltage and current and equaling zero. So this kind of represents two different equations. This kind of operates on each of these, so you distribute the V and the I onto each of these, and each of them is equal to zero. That's kind of shorthand notation you may see in textbooks and the like. I'll probably use longhand notation from here on out. I, I tend to scare the grad students with this kind of stuff, but you know, it's just showing off really, right? Okay, so those are our partial differential equations. Now, let's switch over and talk about a generic form that will always, uh, the solution will always follow for that system of equations. I'll put it on the board here. My voltage as a function of space and time will vary dramatically depending on what I connect to the transmission line. That's the boundary value part of the problem. But it will always have the following form. It will always be some amplitude, V plus, a constant that represents uh, the magnitude of my signal. There will be a functional shape. We will call it F of T minus Z over the velocity of propagation. And this really represents a traveling wave as a function of space. It's kind of difficult to visualize that. But if you can imagine, first of all, if you just held space constant, your location on the transmission line constant, what, what you'd have is a, thing that, uh, a function that was a function of space, uh, time only. And over time, you would see the waveform develop as it sort of passed, the voltage passed by that location in space. If on the other hand, uh, well, let me, let me put it this way. As I move down the line, I increase Z. And as Z increases, I'm subtracting off something that has uh, units of time. This is meters, this is meters per second. So as Z increases, this time offset increases as well. And because there's a minus side in front of it, I am retarding in time the, the waveform that I observe. And so as I move down the transmission line, I see the exact same thing as I would have seen over here, just later. And that's indicative of a constant velocity traveling waveform. So that's, that's part of the solution. Now there's another part of the solution, and it has almost the same form, 
And intuitively, it, it makes sense that there should be another part of the solution because this is a symmetrical device. If a waveform can travel with constant velocity down this direction, it should also be able to travel, send a waveform in the other direction. So the other form that the solution takes will be V minus the amplitude in volts of the backwards traveling wave. And then it will have the exact same argument, except we will change this sign so that as you move with decreasing z towards the front of the line, you will see a more retarded waveform, that, which is indicative of a backwards traveling waveform. You'll see the same thing you see over here as you do over here on the load side just later. So let me, let me even label those. Make sure you have this labeled in your notes. This is the forward propagating wave. And that's the backwards propagating wave. OK, OK. Well, where there's smoke, there's fire. And where there's fire, there's also current. Well, when there's voltage, there's also current, right? That was my analogy. Yeah? Is that velocity or voltage? The big V is voltage. So amplitude of voltage. And there's a V. I put a little superscript plus to denote forwards traveling. This is the convention your book uses and most other textbooks. Minus represents backwards propagating. Kind of the directions in Z that this waveform is traveling. Good question. <coughs> okay, so where there's smoke, there's fire. Where there's voltage, there's always going to be current on a transmission line. And if your voltage takes this form, then your current must take the following form, V plus over Z naught, because we have, need something volts over ohms that has units of amps. We're describing a current, so this should have physical units of amps. And it will have the exact same functional shape as what you put in up here as the voltage. And this is the most critical part. It's very subtle, but it's the most critical part. A minus sign. And then again, an identical copy of the backwards traveling wave, scaled by the impedance. Again, because we are looking at something with respect to amps, not voltage when we talk about current. And there you have it. Any solution to the telegrapher's equations follows this general mathematical format. Now, I've got to add two pieces of information, because as it stands now, I have these two mysterious constants, velocity of propagation and impedance of the transmission line. And I haven't told you where they came from. I just kind of pulled them in out of thin air. But it turns out they're relatable to the electrical characteristics of the line, the per unit length inductance and the per unit length capacitance that are intertwined electrically down the line. So my velocity of propagation is 1 over the square root of LC, product of per unit length inductance and per unit length capacitance. Remember these aren't this is Henry's per meter times Farad's per meter. And when you work the units you get meters per second. They're not standalone capacitances, Farad's and Henry's, uh, like you're used to dealing with your circuit courses. And this is in meters per second. And the intrinsic impedance Z naught is equal to the per unit length inductance over the per unit length capacitance. Take the square root. If you look at that, that actually has units of ohms. And it describes the ratio of voltage to current that the line will transport. 
Every, geometry, every line is different if you play around with the geometry, but once you fix the geometry, the ratio of voltage to current that that line will carry is fixed. And uh, you're kind of stuck with whatever that is. So for example, in, in this class, we'll of, often talk about like the 50 ohm line. That's a standard impedance that when people design circuits, for example, they try to make everything 50 ohms. And the reason for that will become apparent uh, by either the end of this lecture or uh, sometime early next week, hopefully, when we talk about termination schemes and reflections and all some of the bad things that happen on transmission lines. But this is, a, this is the natural ratio of voltage to current. One thing it is not, and this, this confused me when I was an undergraduate when I first saw transmission line theory, because every impedance that I'd ever been associated with, uh, every resistive value, real, uh, real value in ohms, meant loss, right? When you, when you studied uh, uh, resistor in your, what is that, uh, 2040 class, when you did your first circuit analysis, or maybe it was back in physics, some, this device had a value in ohms, and it was the ratio of voltage to current that the device accepted. But all of that power that it accepted was turned into heat, right? And kind of ohmic losses burnt up because there was some finite uh, conductivity in the medium of that device. And it was sort of, you know, the physics behind it all, right? The electrons, they want to go one way and they crash into elect uh, atoms and make collisions and impart their uh, kinetic energy to that, uh, which you know, causes effectively heat by jiggling the, the uh, substrate. So, Dr. Dargan. Yes. This is Bill in Savannah. Okay, Bill. I've got a question about the uh, your the generic form. Yeah, sure. You have you have a Z naught, which is the intrinsic impedance. That's but right. But also in the equation, you have just a Z. Yeah. So, little Z. And I apologize for, for uh, in advance. I'm using the, the book terminology, and it's a little bit easier to recognize when you typeset. Little z is position down the transmission line. Capital Z naught is the intrinsic impedance. So z equals little z equals to zero is at the front of the line. Uh, z equals to the length of the line is at the end of the line, and then z equals to d over two is halfway down. D over four is a quarter of the way down. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks. Okay, great. So yeah, just recognize that we are dealing with ideal lossless transmission lines. So even though there's an intrinsic impedance, no energy is, is expended when the wave travels down these lines. So that's just one thing to get in. Is as soon as uh, you know, people, see, uh, at least when I was an undergrad, as soon as I saw an intrinsic impedance in a transmission line, I started to want to like insert resistors for the bars of the transmission line, which is not the thing to do. This is not that kind of device. Simply the ratio of voltage to current that it transmits a waveform. None of the power is lost, even though there is a, an impedance. Okay. So let's see. What can we do next? Let's go ahead and start talking about some geometry of transmission lines. That's always kind of fun. What are the different transmission lines we see out there in the real world? Let me get uh, a new board going here. Let me start with the simplest one. And that is the parallel plate. transmission line. Parallel plate transmission line. So I'm going to warm up here. I'm going to uh, practice my 3D rendering ability. A parallel plate transmission line looks like this. A thin strip of metal that kind of tapers, and this is the, the Z dimension, so if this is the front of the line, this would be Z, increasing position of observation. And then there is another one underneath to uh, serve as the bottom bar for our transmission line. Unusual computer-like rendering of a three-dimensional object. Look at that. 
And of course, around here is stuff. And in electromagnetism, stuff, no matter how complicated it is, we always try to reduce it down to just two parameters. Uh, sometimes more, but in this class too. Epsilon and mu. The permittivity and the permeability of the medium. If this is vacuous free space or air, which is pretty electrically close to vacuous free space, then epsilon has the value of epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space. Recall that epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 farads per meter. If this is mu of free space, mu will be mu naught, where mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7th henrys per meter. If instead of free space, you've kind of encased this thing in plastic or some other insulating material that doesn't conduct, then these will not be the same values. As a convention, we define this parameter epsilon sub r, a unitless value that is relative permittivity. It's always going to be greater than or equal to 1 for the most part. Basically, it's 1 when there's just not that much stuff in the area. It'll be greater than 1. It can be 4, 5, 10. There's some even specially engineered materials that uh, have a natural per relative permittivity in the hundreds. In fact, there are some specially resonant materials that at certain frequencies behave as if they had thousands of, of relative permittivity. Uh, which is pretty darn impressive, and you can do some really neat things with it. But for the most part, if you want a physical explanation, you may re uh, remember from your physics class that permittivity is sort of like how much energy you can store electrically in a material. If you view an atom or a molecule as a collection of positive nuclei and then a bunch of electrons floating around them, if you impress a field on that uh, molecule or atom, you're going to make the electrons kind of push them to one side, and then you're going to push the uh, uh, nuclei to the other side. And you, you almost have like a spring. You've got something that you're stretching and you're storing energy. And that makes a countervailing electric field that we'll talk about later that suppresses the impressed field and effectively stores energy in the medium. The better the medium can do that, the higher the, ups, the permittivity. But we're not going to worry about the material science of it quite yet. Uh, likewise, we do the same thing for permeability. I introduce these things now because we'll see them later on. We call relative perme permeability mu sub r. And mu sub r, the, the physics of mu sub r are actually a good bit more complicated than uh, epsilon sub r. The fortunate thing in this class is that most dielectric materials, if you treat mu sub r as 1, in other words, if your permeability is approximately equal to free space, you're going to get the right answer. It's actually very hard to find materials that have a mu sub r that differs much more than 1. Now, there are some materials that, that have mu sub r less than 1 or a little bit greater than 1. These are changes that are measured in like the fourth or fifth decimal place. Water's a good example of that. Um, that water actually has a mu sub r of 0.999 something. Um, and it, it really takes something like a ferromagnetic material, one of these engineered alloys with iron in it or some other strange combination of metals, to get a mu sub r that's appreciably different from one. So, unless, so the, the significance in this class is, unless I tell you otherwise, you can always assume mu is zero, uh, mu naught, 4 pi times 10 to the negative uh, 7 henrys per meter. Okay, so this is the scenario that we're looking at. We've got strips here, and the, the length, of course, of the line is in this dimension, d. Uh, I'm going to call the width 
W, and then the height separating these two strips of metal, H. And it turns out that once you've established these geometrical and material properties of the stuff around it, I can calculate everything. I'm going to give you these formulas uh, as if they fell from the sky. In a couple of months, we'll actually be able to derive or at least set up the calculations for figuring out what is the intrinsic impedance and the intrinsic, uh, the per unit length inductance and the capacitance and the velocity of propagation. But for now, I'll just give you the equations. Uh, we'll cheat. So. The per unit length inductance is going to be permeability times D over W. Uh, let me change this to D. That's how my notes read. So D is the separation distance between the two pieces of metal. D over W. Height separation over width. The per unit length capacitance is a similar expression. It's equal to epsilon width over the separation distance, little d. So you can see that as you increase the distance between these two, the capacitance drops. Well, that makes sense, right? It's kind of like a parallel plate capacitor. If you take two plates and you move them farther apart, the capacitance is going to drop. The inductance, though, the per unit length inductance, increases. And it's increasing inversely proportional to the amount that the capacitance is increasing or decreasing. And of course, once we have these expressions, it's not that hard to compute the intrinsic impedance because we know it's related to L and C. Square root of L over C, if we plug these expressions in, we will get D over W the ratio of the gap length divided by the width times the square root of mu over epsilon. That has units of ohms. And you can see that if we want to design a transmission line to a target impedance, we actually have four values to play with. Three if you don't want to do anything with magnetic materials. We can change the, the dielectric around the object. That will influence the impedance the width between the traces of metal, uh, the width of the strips themselves, W. The velocity of propagation is similar. That's 1 over the square root of LC. And if we, if we put in the expressions that uh, we've developed here, what we will get is that the velocity of propagation is 1 over the square root of mu epsilon. Interestingly enough, for these types of homogeneous transmission lines where we have one kind of stuff with a constant permittivity and permeability around the object, for the most part, the velocity of propagation doesn't actually depend on the geometry of the line. It depends only on the material around it. The geometry always seems to drop off. And that's something you'll see again and again in the expressions that we put up here on the board. Any questions so far? So tell me, what do you think this is good for? What's a good example of a parallel plate transmission line? In what scenario might you use something like that? Two strips of metal carrying a signal over a long distance. Scenario. Well, this would be uh, maybe a good approximate expression for some of the transmission lines that you develop on printed circuit boards. In fact, several of the examples that I'm going to put up here on the board come from the printed circuit board community, which many of you will have to experience if you haven't already done so on, in a co-op of some sort. Anybody ever make a printed circuit board at their co-op or in the privacy of their own bedroom? or No? OK, good, good. we got some good students with some hands-on experience. Uh, what kind of board did you make? Uh, like a V-meter. Oh, really? Cool, cool. Yeah, and was it, did I have a, a, who did you use to fabricate the printed circuit board? Uh, I got a PCB printer in my mm -hmm. uh, like house. 
So. Oh, you have one in your house. Well, that's where I live, yeah, in the frat house. Uh, in the frat house. There's a PCB machine in the house, yeah. in the frat house. Yeah, this it. is an incredible fraternity. Tell me, what fraternity do you belong to? <laughs> Can I join? Yeah, I mean, if you want, are you want to rush? <laughs> Don't joke. I actually did rush a fraternity once when I came here. It's sort of retaliation. The first class I ever taught at Georgia Tech was this 3025 class, and I had two wise guys from Theta Xi. They always used to sit right about there next to each other. And they were just cut ups. You know, this is back when we had uh, blackboards and chalk. And uh, oh man, they were always. I caught one of them mocking my hand gesture. You know, I get kind of animated in my talks, I get kind of excited. One of these guys is like mocking my hand gestures and uh, like, uh, and I turned around after I was finished in the, writing my thing on the board and I caught him, right? And I got so angry. I was like, David, will you pay attention? I threw my chalk at him. And he was so excited. I never saw a student pay attention so, so dramatically more after that because he got attention. He loved it. And so, but they were good guys. I, I even had them over for dinner once. And uh, to retaliate the next spring, and this was when I had le much less gray hair than I do, I put a baseball cap on and some jeans, and I untucked my shirt, and I rushed the fraternity uh, that first week. And I got 40 minutes into the presentation. I had already, we were bonding with, uh, I, had, I had totally gotten a tour of the frat house, and uh, the two guys walked around the corner, and they just started shaking their head. And the poor guy that was giving me the tour, when they found out I was their EMAG professor, his jaw just dropped and his face got all white. He's like, oh, it's okay, I was just trying to get back at Brian and David. So, anyway, that's cool. So, Alpha, Gamma, Delta. That's not yours. Oh, okay. Oh, that's a sorority? Okay. They had all sorts of equipment in the basement of his sorority. Okay, uh, well, okay, let's go to, to, to continue on. That was a tangent. Uh, where might we use a parallel plate transmission line? Okay, so if you look at a printed circuit board, you use an FR4 board when you're in your circuit milling? No, I mean, the guys buy like little, like, like clad boards. Oh. Like mouse or oh, okay. How about how about some of these other guys that have done? Uh, uh, who else has done a printed circuit board? Tell me about your board. Uh, we actually use paper. Paper. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And then did, did like some uh, inkjet printing on it. Neat. How about yours? What's your, what's your printed circuit uh, board? We put in a, a spray of, of a lacquer type material and use a laser cutter to cut out where we want to etch. Hey, nice. A laser cutter etching on a board. What, what kind of board was it? Uh, it was just a clad PCB. A PCB? Okay. So, this is just like the grocery store. You either have paper or plastic. Uh -huh. And a lot of uh, printed circuit boards, you'll get them as blanks. I don't know what your experience. Every, every experience is a little bit different. But when we fabricate boards up on the fourth floor with the milling machine that's open to any students for senior design or what have you, you'll get a blank a blank printed circuit board. The middle is a sandwich, basically. There's a conductive layer, usually copper, on both sides. It's very thin. And then inside is a dielectric, a plastic, or often a paper, something that insulates these two. And uh, uh, the common substrate that we use is called FR4. Basically, fiberglass resin, and the permittivity is about four. Permeability is, relative permeability is one. Relative permittivity is four. This is a nice, very inexpensive uh, circuit board that you can, probably the cheapest one that you can get. And there are actually services where you can do all your layouts in, in AutoCAD or some sort of uh, computer design program, uh, Eagle, or there's all these other types of. Uh, uh, softwares that you can download for free and design your circuits. And then for 50 bucks you can get it manufactured and then FedExed to your house um, so that you don't have to dirty yourself with uh, the printed circuit board and uh, milling machine in your basement or what have you. Not that that isn't cool to have in your basement though. So this is what it looks like. And the way that this works, there are several different techniques for making the circuit. 
you can specify the, the top and the bottom, some schematics and to a computer, and the computer will either, uh, there, there are some machines that are milling based, where there's a robotic little high speed drill bit that scrapes away wherever you don't want the copper to be. So you put this blank in the machine and it'll scrape away everything that isn't, say, a transmission line circuit. Uh, and then there are other techniques, some involve chemical etching, where you put down a lacquer, uh, maybe that was similar to what you were doing, you, where you start with conductivity, you put down a lacquer wherever you don't want uh, the con uh, conductive medium touched, and you dip it in acid or some corrosive chemical that gets away the copper that you don't want, and what you're left with is a transmission line. That's what you did? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is the green stuff, green or yellow. Yep, fiberglass resin, uh, permittivity 4, epsilon r equals to 4, roughly. So a lot of the transmission lines we study in this class kind of take on this topology. In fact, if you were to have a transmission line, if you were to cut this in a cross section and etch away two strips of material, in this diagram I've got two strips coming out of the board, then you'd have essentially a parallel plate transmission line. This would be your D, this would be your width. And you could analyze this circuit that you've made using the system of equations that we just came up with. Now, most of you that were probably doing your boards probably didn't care that you were making a parallel plate transmission line or something like that, because you weren't working at the high enough frequencies to, to really care. The wavelength of your frequency content that you were probably transporting was, you know, meters and meters. You didn't care about your little circuit board. But I've got an example of several circuit boards here with different topologies. I don't think I have one at parallel plate, but I've got a couple of the next ones we'll talk about where we very much cared about the, uh, uh, the transmission line effects. And I'll pass around examples so, so that you can actually see the geometry instead of relying on my silly little cartoons on the board. So this, this might be an example of, uh, how, of a system of equations you could use to approximate the intrinsic impedance and the velocity of propagation of this structure and how it would ca carry signals. I say approximate because we don't actually have an exact parallel plate transmission line. We would need a little bit of epsilon r up here and some down here to make a homogeneous medium. But it turns out that most of the fields in this structure are confined to this area anyway, so it winds up being a pretty good approximation. Okay, the coaxial cable. The coaxial cable. Again, let me resort to three-dimensional drawings of structures. I've got a tube of metal, a hollow tube of metal. And then I have a little strand of metal on the inside. The little strand of metal has radius little a. The outer conductor has radius little b, but their, their centers are aligned. And the stuff in the middle has epsilon r and mu r. And I do have a physical example of this. Uh, and I, I'm sure you have even see these in your own home. This is what you use for cable television and a lot of different connections. Here's a coaxial cable. I don't know if you've seen one quite like this. This is an SMA connector, not a BNC, which is usually or, uh, the, like the 75 ohm line that you use in your home. This is a little higher grade. It's meant for higher frequency signals in the microwave uh, regime. But I'll go ahead and pass it around. Don't bend it. Don't kink it or anything. Just kind of be gentle with it because it's an expensive cable. Cables get kind of like exponentially <coughs> more expensive as you go up in frequency. So. But you can see, if you look at the connectors, there's an inner conductor. Diameter's about a millimeter. And uh, you can't see it, but you can kind of feel it. There's an outer conductor that's all metal that sheathes the system. So I'll go ahead and put this, pass this around. <coughs> so. For this system of, of transmission line, your per unit length inductance is mu over 2 pi. 
natural logarithm b over a, the ratio of the outer and the inner conductor, times whatever the permeability of this stuff inside is. The per unit length capacitance, or remember these are all per unit length values, farads per meter and henrys per meter. If we wanted to get the total inductance of the system or the total capacitance of this, we just multiply by the length, whatever length the chunk of line is, the d value. Remember, this is z going kind of into the board in this diagram. That's where you're sending your, down your signals. And my capacitance is equal to 2 pi epsilon over the natural logarithm of b over a, the eight ratio of the outer to the inner conductor. And these, again, are co come from basic physics. We can even set these up and calculate them later in the class. Color ISO cable is a really useful form of transmission line. We see it all the time. All of your laptops and stuff have internal coaxial cables to trunk signals from, say, your, <coughs> your uh, antenna for your Wi-Fi to the actual radio that demodulates them. Um, you've seen them in your cable boxes and all sorts of other places. Uh, it's a good example, though, of, of how varied the topology of a transmission line uh, can be. Because here, the, the two pieces of conductor that, whose voltage, differential, and currents traveling down them carry the signal are very asymmetrical. You know, when you look at the symmetrical, uh, that symmetrical parallel plate transmission line structure, it kind of makes sense that I would draw as a circuit diagram a top bar and a bottom bar to represent the two conductors that carry this, the waveforms. In this case, it's a little more abstract because I've got something that is just a tiny little piece of metal in the middle and then this hollow tube of metal. But in our circuit representation, one is the top bar, one is the bottom bar. The voltage that propagates down that circuit uh, diagram is the voltage differential between those. And the current that waveform that propagates down there is the total current that flows on the inside and the total distributed current that travels on the outside. So if I sum up all the currents around here and all the current on the inside, I get two equal values that represent my current waveform inching down the line when the signal travels there. Now, if I know what my LMIC is, Remember, VP is 1 over the square root of LC. Oh, big surprise there. All the geometry cancels, and it's 1 over the square root of mu epsilon. That's my velocity of propagation. Z naught is the same deal. Once we have per unit length inductance and capacitance, square root of L over C is equal to 1 over 2 pi natural logarithm of b over a times the square root of mu over epsilon. So again, by controlling the geometry and the material, I can design for a target velocity of propagation and a target intrinsic impedance. Yeah? Can we assume the, uh, the value of mu sub r as well? Yes, you may always use, assume that unless I tell you specifically that you're dealing with kind of an exotic magnetic dielectric that <clears throat> whose mu sub bar is not close to one. Almost anything that doesn't conduct has a mu sub bar of one. There are some excep exceptions. You can make a densely packed paramagnetic substrate uh, that might have mu sub bar in the ten or you know five or something like that. But it's un that would be very unusual. You know, always assume mu sub r is equal to 1 in this class. Any other questions? Let's well, see, this is easy, right? You just change the geometry around, you change, you change your impedance, and you change your velocity of propagation. Why might you prefer this topology over the parallel plate transmission line? Why pick one or the other? That's right, cables can bend. This is easy to make on one of those extruding machines, right? If you want to con connect things uh, that you don't know physically where they are, you know, a priori, you want a generic transmission line, you can bend to your path. 
obviously this is not very easy to make on a circuit board, so that kind of precludes it from that application. At least on board, I've seen people jump signals from one end of the board to the other on a nice coax. Why else might you use this? What is a nice property about it? I don't know if you can grasp this because we haven't really talked too much about field theory, but most of you from physics too have enough intuition. Zero. What? Yeah, well, the fields. There are no magnetic or electric fields outside the transmission line. So that's a great trade-off. That's a great trade-off. This is, in, a, in terms of cost per inch, this is actually much more expensive to build than a printed circuit board. Uh, but the nice thing about it is that all the fields, all the fields are confined to this interior region. And that's important. Because it turns out that if you bring another transmission line or an antenna or something close to a transmission line that doesn't have perfect field confinement, you will actually couple your signal both to and from that device. So the coaxial cable is nice because there's this Faraday cage around the entire assembly. The ground, plant, the ground sheath goes over the entire thing. Fields stay in, and the fields that are outside can't get, get in. No not accepting interference onto your signal from other sources, and you're not making it for anyone else. You're a good signal neighbor. Comes at a cost, though. Can't do it on cheaply on a PCB. Okay, here's a little more sophisticated PCB one. So all you people that did circuit boards, all of your circuit boards were probably two layers, right? They had a substrate, paper, plastic, and then metal on either side. Anybody ever do like a multi-layer board, more than two layers? Was it out on paper as well? It was, um, we didn't actually print it, but we designed it. You designed it. Oh, okay. Cool, cool. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. That's one of the reasons why you do a, a multi-layer board. Because, you know, a lot of the, the circuit boards that you make for consumer electronics, for example, Lots of different electrical signals are being uh, routed and traveled on the same board. You need DC power signals to drive all your integrated circuits that require a power supply, right? You need to have logic circuits, logic switching and that sort of thing. So that's a, another type of signal. A lot of times you'll need an RF uh, circuit. You know, something that will transmit a carrier that's much higher frequency than your other circuits. And, you know, you can have different power supplies as well. The point is you have a lot of different types of signals living on the same boards. And some signals do not live well with others. For example, if you're sending a sensitive electronic signal, like a microwave signal, from one end of your board to the other, and if you're using uh, the same kind of electrical layer as, say, your power circuit, you can actually get noise from other devices that couple in through your power lines uh, and, and will kind of pop up unexpectedly on your circuit and make more interference for you. It'll corrupt your data waveform or your whatever you're, you're routing around. So that's an example of a type of board that is multi-layer. And multi-layer boards, um, or that, that's an example of a circuit that you'd want to use a multi-layer uh, board approach to. So for example, you might have a printed circuit board. So here's a plastic layer it going into the board. And then here's maybe a, a separating ground plane. So it's a solid piece of metal. And then to that, you can glue another circuit board, adhesively compress them, heat them, kind of fix them together. And you can put, say, a, you know, some circuit traces on this side and some circuit traces on the other side, like this. So even though these transmission lines are really close to one another, this ground plane effectively quarantines all the fields on either side so that they don't couple and distort and cause interference for one another. Now, the transmission line topology that I'm going to show you next is actually the reverse of what I've drawn. If you've got a really delicate signal on a printed circuit board and you want to sequester it from all the nasty other effects, 
what you draw what you can do is make three layers one of them a conductive layer on one side another a conductive layer on the other side and then a strip that is halfway in between them yeah, you have a question? I was going to ask about the previous drawing. We uh -huh. had the uh, ground layer in the middle. Did you still have a strip going through on the ground layer to uh, interact with both? <coughs> um, yeah, um, so in that scenario that I drew before where the ground plane was in the middle, you could actually treat the ground plane and the top strip as one transmission line and the, the other one, the, the ground plane and the other one as a separate uh, transmission line that doesn't couple. In fact, what that really is is two what we call micro strips, which is my next drawing, uh, glued on top of each other for signal isolation. We're going to look at the reverse case really quick because I got some equations for this one too. So it gives us a little variety to deal with. Uh, let's see, what are my dimensions here? I'm going to call this distance between the two ground planes B. And then my strip width here is going to be A. And you assume that, of course, this is B over 2, and this is B over 2. This is kind of like a squashed coax in rectangular form. In fact, a lot of people will electrically connect these with physical connections over all on the distant side. And what happens is you've got a top bar. You can think of this as your top bar your one potential, and then all of this is at your other potential. So it's really the voltage drop from here to everywhere around here that propagates the signal down the line. And of course, you can fill this with dielectric mu and a, uh, uh, epsilon, usually mu naught, and then whatever plastic you've decided or whatever dielectric non-conducting substance you've filled this thing with. Nice mechanically stable circuit uh, diagram all of your fields are confined between these two layers, so you don't have to worry about external radiation getting in. You don't have to worry about stuff that you populate and do outside on another layer getting in. And this is called the symmetrical strip line. Two M's or one. Oh, I'm the worst speller. This is also a good example of a slightly more complicated geometry that doesn't have a really cute, easy to derive uh, uh, equation for its impedance and its velocity of propagation. Uh, this is more empirically based. So let's see here. So this guy, his velocity of propagation is going to be 1 over the square root of mu epsilon. Well, there's no surprise. It's only going to be a function of the material property because this is a homogeneous medium for the fields. There's no other stuff in there. Z naught, on the other hand, is a little bit more complicated. It's going to be 30 pi square root of epsilon r b over the effective A, or width, of the strip, plus 0.441B. And the effective area, this little helper variable, is equal to A, if A is greater than 0.35B, the width of this thing, if that A is 0.35 the height separating the two ground planes, then you just use the value A. If it gets smaller than that, though, you have to curve fit this thing. A minus 0 0.33 minus A over B squared times B. This is for A less than 0.35B. You see, this, that's not very elegant, right? There's not all these nice pi's and e's and natural logarithms, so you know that that wasn't derived by some professor sitting in their office. That was curve-fitted data by a grad student tirelessly characterizing different geometries of this thing, changing the width and the 
and the separation distance. Yeah? What is that value of 30 pi over t? What did, what did they do? 30 pi? Yeah. It's kind of the ether. You know, they said, oh, this is a good value for uh, uh, looking at these types. We'll just lump it into 30 pi, and then these other numbers come out. And they, they may have, a lot of times, these problems will have exact solutions on pen and paper if you take like a limiting case, a really long A, for example. And if you had a really long A, then probably this disappeared, this was A, and then, you know, the answer was 30 pi B over A divide by the square root epsilon r. And I think, oh, that's a nice solution to start out with. And then so everything was kind of curve-fitted from that point on as you shrink down the a. That's just speculation, but I'm guessing that's where the 30 pi came from. There is a nice pen and paper solution where you get a cute little pi out of your mathematics. Good question. OK, any questions about the symmetrical strip line? No? Let's do one more. This is a really common one. I even have an example of this one to pass around. This is another PCB, printed circuit board related transmission line. This is the microstrip. This one's really important because it's, it's for a two layer board. It's easy to manufacture. In fact, you only have to do one uh, you only really have to etch away or mill out metal on one side of the circuit board. You have a common ground plane for all of your devices. So this is my conductive copper ground plane or aluminum. Either one could be used. My dielectric FR4 or plastic or paper of substance, epsilon R. Mu R. And then on top of that is a strip. This is your top bar, this is your bottom bar. The voltage waveform traverses the structure like that. Uh, the width of the strip, if you use the notation in the book, is A and the thickness is B. So this is really good because you, you can dread, etch out all of your circuit paths on the symmetrical microstrip uh, topology and then drop surface, surface mount components onto them. In fact, you can even do that with one of these robotic pick and place machines. You, I don't know, has anyone ever uh, on your co-op seen one of those? It's basically you, you can fabricate your circuit board then you put it in a pick and place machine. And each pick and place has like a, um, a reel of components on it. I should, Try to find one upstairs if I can, uh, where each one is kind of hermetically sealed in its own little uh, capsule and it comes off of a spool. And the robotic thing just kind of picks that chunk, chunk out and plops it down. And then, you know, there's usually, usually a little bit of conductive adhesive or a solder, uh, kind of a solder paste that you put down. It kind of holds the things light, lightly into place. And then you take it over to the oven and you heat it up and all the, so all the surface mount components kind of solder down to their traces. Very, uh, very simple, high speed way to assemble an extraordinarily complicated circuit board. So this is a, this is a very useful one. And I've got an example here and some other ones that I'll, I'll pass around. <clears throat> Again, this one is complicated. Complicated not just because of the geometry is asymmetrical, but also you've got air up here and then plastic in here. So we have something called an effective epsilon, which is a blend of free space epsilon naught and whatever plastic epsilon R that you've put in here. And the velocity of propagation then is 1 over the square root of mu epsilon effective. The z naught is more complicated. This is, again, another one of these curve fit expressions. 1 over 2 pi, the square root of mu over epsilon effective. 
natural log 8b over a plus a over 4b if a is less than b. And if a is greater than b, I got to use this other curve fit, which is just the square root of mu over epsilon effective times 1 over a over b plus 1.393 plus 0.667 log a over b plus 1.444. That's complicated. Hey, don't worry. These formulas are all in your books. In fact, there's a nice formula in your book if you want to reverse the calculation. If you say, I want a target impedance, what is the combination of A or B that will give me that? That's a useful formula to have. In fact, you might be using it on a future homework. Yeah? Yeah, that's right. That's this term here. This term times that, which is in a denominator. And then this term over here. Kind of a, it's a weird kind of blending of air and plastic. And that particular value is very useful for the expressions. Just kind of parses out that way. Well, let me show you a couple of copies of these. Uh, here's my microstrip. Uh, the circuit that I have in here is actually there's a patch antenna being fed by a microstrip. You see the ground plane on one side, a little trace on the top, and then it looks like it just dead ends in this hunk of metal. That metal is actually an antenna, and it'll take a high frequency signal and radiate it out into space. You've got versions of pat uh, patch antennas in all of your phones and various other uh, electronic devices that you use, whether you realize it or not. Let's see. This is a really interesting one. We're not going to put any equations on this one. Uh, uh, on the board, because if you think this is complicated, holy cow. But this is a really nice one used in microwave engineering. It's called a uh, coplanar waveguide. It looks a lot like the microstrip, except they've left the metal. In fact, let me do this with a different color so you don't get confused in your notes. This is not a microstrip. This is a coplanar waveguide. You leave some of the metal on here. So it's almost like a combination between the symmetrical strip line and the microstrip. And you also send what's called a via. A via is a hole through the circuit board that electronically it's, it gets lined with conductive material and electrically connects the top layer to the bottom layer. So you've got your vias along each side here called a coplanar waveguide. And this is for the diehards that want to make sure they sequester all the fields close into the strip and so they don't kind of radiate off or travel to different parts of the board and cause signal and noise for other unwanted uh, lines. So I got an example of that. This one I don't have in the bag. You can just look at it as an old circuit. But you can actually see the vias drilled down, as well as what looks like a microstrip with the metal going almost right up to the top, right up to the edge. And then, oh, here's one. This is actually a very, very simple one. If you don't have any metal on the one side, if you scrape it all away, and you just put your two transmission line traces on the top, thing. That's called a coplanar strip. I have an example of that too. We're not going to study that one in terms of equations, but it's a useful one. Okay. Any questions thus far? I want to have perfect understanding? Yeah, go ahead. Um, do we need to, are there any formulas for the um Capacitance or inductance of the microstrip or the symmetrical strip line? Or do we just. Uh, let's see. Your book, I don't think there's any in your book, but if you wanted to, you could calculate that, right? If you know L and C, you can get VP and Z naught, the intrinsic impedance and the velocity of propagation. It's pretty easy to reverse that calculation as well. This is a really good question because I think your homework assignment deals with it, which I've already posted online. Due next Thursday. So. 
if z naught is equal to the square root of L over C, and the velocity of propagation is 1 over the square root of LC, if you're given this, these two, and you want L and C, you can reverse the calculation pretty easily. Basically, z naught over VP should give you L, right? You flip this up, you got square root of L over C times the square root of LC, that'll just give you L. And likewise, if you wanted C, what would you have to do here? Uh, you would have to 1 over z naught VP. And that, I believe, should give you C. Good question. Any other questions? No? Let me uh, switch to the overhead camera here. Okay. So here's a couple of uh, sketches of some of the transmission line topologies we talked about. And this kind of talks about the, the trade-off between cost and simplicity of the geometry and field confinement. I've got some sketches here that uh, you can see um, the symmetrical strip line and then the two ground planes besides here. And your little sketches kind of represent what the electric fields are doing so you figure out where they are. Notice none of them are out here. This is perfect field confinement. That's nice. Unfortunately, it takes a couple of circuit boards pressed together. So the manufacturing of this kind of multi-layer board, they would count this as a layer, and this is a layer, and this is a layer. Anytime you get more than two layers, the, the manufacture of the board actually becomes kind of expensive. Um, so you get what you pay for. Microstrip. Most of the f fields are confined. There'll be a little bit of what we call fringing fields popping up over here. And that'll make a difference. If you get an object, like your hand, for example, and you bring it close to that kind of circuit board, your hand, because it has a different permittivity than this medium here, will distort the, the impedance and the velocity of propagation. And sometimes that can cause detrimental effects to a circuit. Or if you just bring a surface mount component too close to this, that'll also cause some coupling. The parallel plate, that was kind of lousy. Look at all these fringing fields. That doesn't do a very good job of confining signals. So it picks up interference from other sources easily, and it makes interference for other sources as well. And here's a terrible one, too. This is a really cheap coplanar strip. <coughs> Excuse me. That's an example of one of the, the boards that I'm passing around there. You see, all of the fields are in the space, uh, or in free space. So this thing will couple like crazy. In fact, that, that circuit that I'm passing around is actually a, a feed element for some RFID antennas that my group was playing with a long time ago. Uh, if you think what an RFID tag is like, I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they're these really cheap really cheap devices that are placed on paper or plastic. They're supposed to be malleable. They're supposed to be made. You, you have to manufacture them for like five or ten cents a pop. Yeah, you actually do have some chips, RFID chips in uh, your GTID, your buzz, buzz card. Uh, low frequency ones. These are more meant for high frequency ones, that circuit that I'm passing around. And the thing is, you've got to put all your conductor on one side. They, they do something called adhesive transfer. They stamp out the transmission line paths or the antenna uh, topology on a piece of foil and then glue it to the paper or plastic. That turns out to be the rock bottom cheapest way to make it currently. And uh, when you do that, you get this terrible situation where you design your impedance of your antenna or your transmission line for one thing, and as soon as you slap this tag against a carton of milk or the human body or a piece of wood or uh, a plastic object or whatever, it just completely detunes it and changes the electrical parameters. Let me briefly introduce uh, our next topic <clears throat> because this is where the rubber meets the road and we actually get to analyze signals. I told you that for a transmission line, there's an intrinsic impedance, a ratio, a natural ratio of voltage to current that that thing will transport a signal down the line. It's a function of geometry. Once you have the geometry fixed, you can't change it and the material around it. So you send a wave down the transmission line, your telegraph signal or your high-speed logic signal, 
and you get to the end and you have a load on that transmission line. And that load could be a chip, could be a, a telegraph register, could be anything, right? Resistor. Let's say it's a resistor. Resistor has uh, a, a resistance associated with it by Ohm's law. That is the ratio of voltage to current that it accepts. You can't change that once you fix the geometry and the material properties of that device. So if you put a resistor at the end of the line, <clears throat> let's say the line is at 50 ohms and the resistor is at 100 ohms. This waveform gets down to the resistor at a ratio of 50 volts for every one amp of current on the line. And the resistor will only take 100 amp, uh, volts for every one amp of current that goes into it. There are two options at this point. Once that waveform hits the end of the line, either the universe collapses in paradox or something else happens. What is the something else that happens? Yeah. Bounce back. Bounce back, that's right. You, at that junction, you now spawn a reflected wave. And the whole point of the reflected wave is to match the boundary conditions so that you can feed a device uh, that accepts voltage and current in uh, a combination other than the natural transport uh, impedance of your transmission line. So that's good that nature does that. It doesn't collapse in paradox instead. The bad thing is, now you have a signal that starts traveling opposite of the direction that you intended. If it gets to a source who has a different impedance than the transmission line, what happens there? Another reflection comes down. And you start this endless game of ping pong. And this is the root of most of our problems on transmission line. Transmission lines. This is uh, this endless ping pong. Now eventually the waveform that reflects loses its power and you can pretty much assume that it's not there. But if there's what we call a bad mismatch, a lot of difference between the impedance at either the source and or the, the uh, load, you can make this ping pong match last a very long time. And it distorts all of your signals and causes a whole heap of other problems as well. So that's what we're going to talk about on Tuesday when we come back. And we, don't have five, we have five minutes left, which is not enough time to start a new topic. So you can go back over to the bursar's office and re request a 60 cent reimbursement for the unused tuition dollars. <laughs> okay, see you on Tuesday.